We certainly do have a lot of folks out today. Again, this has been a hard season on us with sickness of various kinds. So we need, need to uh, be much in prayer for each other and be mindful to check on one another, call and stop by and, and see how our church family is doing. If you would, open your Bibles with me this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'd like to spend, if the Lord be pleased this morning, a good bit of time in chapter 5, chapter 6, and the first verse of uh, chapter 7. But I'd like to focus your attention upon 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 14. I'd like for us to read that verse in the beginning. Paul writes, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. The love of Christ constraineth us. Any English teacher worth a salt will tell you that that little prepositional phrase of Christ has as his object the love. And so what the message is there is this is Christ's love for you and not your love for him. The knowledge that our Lord loves us constrains us. The word constrain that constraineth comes from a uh, Greek word that literally means to him in close, to hold close. <clears throat> it would be something like similar to what happens to an ox that's under a yoke. That yoke constrains that oxen so that that oxen stays on a steady, reliable course. And so the love of Christ constraineth us. That means the knowledge that he loves us. Just to think about his love, the love of God. Just to think about it. It's what guides us and moves us just to know that one would love us so much that he would do so much for us. And we'll come back to that in a moment. That's the predominant thought that's on my mind, but we need to examine this chapter in its context. The church at Corinth had a number of issues that they were dealing with. Chapter 1, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, details a large number of issues that the church at Corinth had. One of the problems that they were tending toward was adding things to the Word of God adding material things and activities and physical things, you know, uh, things like the, like the Jews of old had in the temple. There was a tendency among the Jewish Christians in particular, who were communicating to the Gentile Christians, there was a tendency to bring physical things into the Christian house of worship. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, they had all kinds of uh, tables and carvings and things and lamps and those kind of things in the temple. Well, all of those things in the temple in, of old pointed toward the spiritual things of the New Testament kingdom of God. Even today, modern Christianity um, uh, uh, adds a lot of things to the worship service. Some will even add physical things, things you can hold in your hand and things that you bow before and worship before. All kinds of things are done today in the, ne in the name of Christianity that the Apostle Paul addresses right here in this chapter. He's warning the church at Corinth, do not go in that direction. Paul said of himself in his Christian life uh, that he lived his life in simplicity and sincerity. The beauty that you see when you come together in the house of God is the beauty of your love for each other, the beauty of the Lord for you. We come to hear Jesus in our heart. 
in the singing and the praying and the preaching of the gospel. Uh, we don't come to see beautiful things naturally. If I like to have a nice looking building, nice looking yard, nice looking grass. And yard. I like to have a nice looking building to meet in. Amen. But that's not what we come to see. We come to see Jesus. We come to experience him in our heart and so that we could leave rejoicing. All of these natural things perish, but not the spirit of God. So let's go back and, and touch a few passages of scripture on the way down to verse number 14. Verse number one, he says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle it were dissolved, and he's talking about this body. He says, if this body dies and just dissolves away, we know this. We know something about this body. So what do you know about your body? What do you know about your body? He says, we know that if this, uh, if this um, uh, earthly house of this tabernacle, that is our a body were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He says, on the day of the resurrection, our spirit's going to live in an, in an eternal house. This body in this context is referred to as a house. That's where your spirit dwells. You know, when you die, only thing that goes is the house. You don't go. What happens to you when that body dies? It returns to the father. Please ask these 12 and 7. It returns, you return, your spirit, that which makes you, you, returns to the Father, which gave that spirit into that body. And so on the day of resurrection, we will have an eternal house, a house that will never die again, that that spirit re will reside in, and then we'll be an eternal living soul, a spirit inside of a body. In verse number two, he says, for in this, that is in this earthly house, in this body, we groan. And don't we groan often in this world? Don't we groan with all kinds of sickness and troubles and disappointments and sadness and all those kind of things? We groan within this body. For in this, that is this body, this earthly house, we groan earnestly designed to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Now, and in some things, well, you know, that, that's sort of morbid. You mean you look forward to dying? Paul said to die is game, to go on to be with the Lord is far better. I rejoice in that, don't you? Do you like to think about that? I really do like to think about being with the Lord, beholding him and looking at him and, and hearing his sweet voice myself. He says, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. And so the spirit one day is not going to be just the spirit by itself. It's going to have a body and will be a living soul for eternity. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, uh, not for uh, that uh, we would be unclothed, but clothed. He says, Paul is uh, saying all this to say, you know, we're not just really out here trying to die. You know, we, we're trying to live. But we do look forward to this eternal house that the Lord's going to give us one day. Now, let's go down to verse number six. Therefore, we are always confident. Now, the major point that's on my mind is what motivates children of God to be faithful to God even in the most austere circumstances. So here he says, therefore we are always confident. Are you always confident? I want to be. Sometimes, sometimes my confidence does, it comes under attack. Let me put it that way. Can we say it that way? Our confidence comes under attack in this life. Knowing that, but he says, therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are in at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. He says, we, while we're here, the spirit is here. We're not in heaven. Okay. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't, we, we've not seen heaven. We've not even seen Jesus Christ. We've never seen a person raised from the dead to life. We've never seen the gates of pearl in the streets of gold. We've never seen that. But we look forward to that. We're confident that that day will come, aren't we? Can we say that, you know, like Job said of old in Job chapter, I know that my Redeemer liveth. 
Now, what kind? To, to me, that is a powerful motivation to serve. And we'll get in a moment to what it took so that you could have that. Okay. Well, we walk by faith. You remember what Paul said about faith in Hebrews 11 and 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so we know this is true because we don't, not because we have physical evidence, but because we have spiritual evidence in our heart. Okay. Then in verse number eight, he says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He says, we, you know, we have a life to live. We have loves and joy and peace and happiness in this life to a degree, but we're willing to lay all that down when the day comes that the Lord says, come home. Come home and be with me and wait with me until the day of the resurrection of the dead. And then he says, verse number nine, for we labor that whether we're present or absent, we may be accepted of him. He's not talking about eternal acceptance. We'll come back to that in a moment. He's talking about in this life. That's right here. I have a somewhat substantial fear that I'll mess up. Paul even, even allowed that even he and apostle could mess up and lose his gracious relationship with the Lord in this life. In this life. Now, what I'm about to read next has to do with this life. And remember the context of the Corinthian letter. This church was tending to involve itself in things that was contrary to the teaching of God. Now, listen to this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And if you look in the border notes of your Bible, and it probably has to do with universal judgment or the last day judgment, you can just draw a line right straight through that. That's not what's under consideration here. That's today. That's right here in this world. You, you disobey God in this life, and you're going to, you won't come here but in judgment before God while you live here. What about a church? You know, so here we are a little number this morning, but we're small in number. So I get together with the deacons and I say, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're small in number and we need to fill up that church building. What kind of things could we do to fill up that church building? Can you think of some things that we could do to fill up a church building? Well, one of the first things I like to do is just bring in a, a bluegrass gospel band. How about that? And so we just have a bluegrass gospel show here in the morning. And um, um, when they're gone, then, then you know, the, the young folks tend to like the, the, the Christian rock type thing. I cannot understand that for the life of me. But they said, well, maybe on some days we could have a Christian rock band come in. And people don't have time to read their Bibles anymore. So, so we'll, just, we'll just put the Bible up and show them what we want them to see out of it. And, um, and by the way, when that's done, we'll, we'll have a video program uh, to illustrate the Bible. And, uh, and by the way, we'll, we'll add some flames in there and we'll, we'll add some, some storms in there to sort of illustrate the Bible so we can attract people. And then after that, we'll have a big party. Well, today would be a good day to do that. You know, we could bring in a big screen television and have a Super Bowl party. Do you know that there's churches in this town uh, that is rushing through their service this morning so they can have a Super Bowl party this afternoon? Now, if you want to get close to my heart, if I was going to tend to do something, that would be it. Okay, but you see what I'm talking about. You are doing this morning exactly what this scripture tells you to do. You brought yourself to the house of God. You engaged yourself in prayer. You lifted up your voice to sing praises unto the Lord your God. You're sitting here this morning under the sound we trust that God will send a preached a message. You're sitting here listening to that. You're digesting that so that you might take it and use it in your life. That is the reason that God put up the church, that we might focus our attention on him and not anyone else or anything, okay? So he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that is in this life, that everyone may receive the things in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 
So God is going to judge. He said to the church of Corinth, God's going to judge you, Corinth church, as to whether or not you have obeyed the word of God. You've added things in. You've done good things. You visited the poor. You visited the widows. You checked on those who are in need. You were kind and gracious. You were generous. Uh, you learned the word of God. You applied the word of God. Your parents taught it to your children. You've done all of those things. Paul says you're going to be judged right here in this life by whether or not you've done those things. Then he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. And there are those that have you to believe that God will make, uh, make you terrified so terrified of hell, he will make you so afraid of hell that you will walk at that straight and narrow path just so that you'll stay out of hell. All right? Now, here's the illustration that I like to use about that. We have five children and 11 grandchildren. Do you think for one second, one second I would threaten one of those children and say to that child, you will never be my child again? Could they be so mean that I would quit loving them? Now, some of them have been mean. But I'll tell you that there is nothing that they can do to make me stop loving them. I will never deny them. I will rebuke them for their behavior, but I will never stop loving them. And there is an infinitely greater father than me. Our heavenly father made a choice to love his children even before he made the world, Ephesians 1 and 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we might be holy and without blame before him in love. God chose to love his people even before he made the world. Jesus said in John chapter 6, of all that the Father hath given me, I have lost nothing. God never threatens his children with eternal hell. He does tell you, I'm your father. This is how you're to behave in this life. I will chasten you if you refuse to obey. That's what he's talking about here. In particular, the church. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade folks. We need to let folks know that God is long-suffering, but sooner or later you keep disobeying God. And one of these days, you're going to get into trouble you can't get out of. I know from experience that that is the case. And then he says, we persuade men, but we were made manifest, uh, manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. For we commend ourselves again to you. Paul says, we are here to serve you. Did you know that the principal duty of a minister is to serve God and God's people? but give you occasion to glory on our behalf. That word occasion comes from a Greek word that means a place to start. Paul says, we've given you a place to start. We've taught you the word of God. This is where you start. You grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. This is where you start. And you continue to grow in obedience to your Lord. That ye, ye may uh, um, have somewhat to answer them which glory in what? In appearance and not in heart. So when you come to church, here's two options. You can glory in heart or glory in appearance. So let's put it on a personal sense. If I wanted to you to glory in me, what would I do? First of all, I would present myself is the R word. You know what the R word is? I would present myself as a reverend. And if I wanted to get really glorious, I'd even put the D word on my name. I would dress myself in such a sophisticated manner that I would command reverential treatment from you. And I would tell you that you get to heaven by my preached word. I tell you that. Not only that, to keep your attention, we would adorn the building with such things that you would just walk in the building and you'd be in awe at the grandeur of the building. We'd have all kinds of organizations and activities to attract and bind you to me. But I would say that I'm binding you to the Lord but I'd be binding you to me. 
Then Paul goes on to say, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be uh, sober, it is for your cause. He says, you know what, sometimes the things we say, you may think we're crazy or beside ourselves. <laughs> you just may think that we've lost our mind, the things we say to you. But whether you think about us, whether you consider it a sober or logical thought, or you think we've lost our minds, he says, it is for your cause. We are here to motivate and to encourage you in the service of God. That's what to herald or to preach the gospel is to do. All right. Then he comes to verse number 14. He's already told you about the terror of God. Then verse number 14, he says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. Like that ox in the yoke who's constrained. Do you feel constrained knowing that God loves you? God the Father loves you so much that he sent his only begotten and beloved son in the world to give his life for you. The son of God loves you so much that he came into this world and willingly went to the cross and gave his life for you. Paul writes of that love in Ephesians 2 and 4 and calls it a great love wherewith he loved us. Do you ever stop and just think about the grandeur of that love? How much he loved you? That when you were yet in your sins, he died for you? We'll come to that passage in a moment. This love is such a binding love that in John chapter 6, verse number 67 and 68, 69, when a lot of folks had left the Lord, he turned to his disciples and he said to them, he says, will you go away also? And these men turned back to the Lord and says, well, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. They were bound to the Savior. Everybody else walked away from the Lord. We said, we don't have any place to go. You're everything to us. All of these other things mean nothing. You are everything to me, Lord. Well, most of us, we have a couple of young folks in the room. But we know what first love is all about, right? First love is that first feeling of love that you have when you're very young. And sometimes folks are blessed to, to marry the person of their first love and and grow up and grow very old together and and uh, then sometimes die together. And sometimes folks don't marry their first love and they go on to love and live with somebody else. But you know the Bible speaks of a first love too. John, who's the apostle of love, writes of it so much in John chapter 4 and verse number 9. John says, it was manifest the love of God might uh, toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God. He says, you want to know what the real uh, strength of this loving relationship is? Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Then in verse number 19, he says, we love him. This is John 4 in 19. We love him because he first loved us. So what is the doctrine of first love? The doctrine of first love is that Jesus Christ loved us when we were yet in our sins, when we were enemies with him, we had no concern for him, no love for him. He still loved us. 
He loved us to come in this world, enough to come in this world to give his life for us, secure our eternal home in heaven, and to promise us and to give us faith to know it, it is even so that one sweet day, though this body has died, this earthly tabernacle has dissolved away, he will come, there will be a resurrection of the dead, the spirit will be reunited with the body, and that we'll all be caught up together in the air with the Lord, so shall we ever be with the Lord. I know that to be true. Okay? First love. He loved us first when we were unlovable. This great love is such that, so well, just how do I know that I have this love? How do I know that this love is in me? Again, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 3, John says, hereby, and hereby do we know that we know him, that is, know him in a loving way, if we keep his commandments. Do you wake every morning with a heartfelt desire to obey his commandments? Do you love him that much? You know, when John chapter 14, and verse number 15, in the gospel account given by John, Jesus Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments. We ought to be motivated, motivated by the knowledge of his great love that he has for us to say, Lord, just what would you have me to do? I'm ready to serve you. And oftentimes he answers the question in his scripture. We know that we love him for another reason. John says again in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life. That is, we have come to a point where we love him because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brethren abideth in death. So let me ask you another question. Do you love each other? Do you long to see this day come when you can see each other's face when you can greet one another and, and embrace one another. I long for it. I wake on Monday morning looking forward to the next opportunity to meet with you because I love you. That love is an evidence that you love the Lord and you love him because why? He first loved you. Now, John also gives us another reason. In John chapter 3, verse number 24, he says, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. You have this knowing, loving relationship with the Lord because he has put his Spirit inside of you. This morning... You have the Spirit of God, Romans chapter 8. You have the Spirit of God dwelling within you. Now, let's go back to our text now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 14. He says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, that is all that the Father hath given him. John chapter 6, Jesus Christ said, Of all that the Father hath given me, I have lost none. This all here refers to all that God the Father had given to him. Because we thus judge, we, we, we make this, we have this understanding. We've evaluated the love of God in our heart. We've evaluated the word of God. And so we've come to a conclusion that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now what does this death mean? You know, sometimes we're dead to the knowledge of the Lord. We're dead to naturally. We're dead because we've moved away. The word death literally means to be separated from. Ephesians 2 and 1, we, found, we find that those who are dead in this context are dead in sin and trespasses. They're dead in sin and trespasses. But what does that mean? In Genesis chapter 3, when Adam disobeyed God, God said to Adam, you can eat of every tree of the, uh, of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely what? Die. 
He lost that daily walk, that close relationship with God because he was dead in trespasses and in sin. That death continued upon man until Jesus Christ declared on the cross in John chapter 19, it is finished. He had finished everything that was necessary to remove that wall of petition that separated you from your God. Now you can come boldly, um, uh, Hebrews 4 and 16, you can come boldly, that is with confidence, under the throne of grace where you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need because that partition has been torn down. You are no longer separated. You are no, no longer removed from the presence of God. You have direct access to him. You don't even have, I appreciate your prayer request. You send me a text, a message, an email, call me, ask me to please pray. I, I am honored and I rejoice to do that for I love you. But each one of you, by the grace and mercy of God, can go boldly, that is with confidence and assurance, directly to the throne of grace, that is where God sits on his throne in heaven, and say to him, My Father, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and bring your petition to him. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. He says, If one died for all, then we're all dead. All were dead in trespasses and in sin until Jesus Christ shed his precious blood and washed you white as snow and gave you life in the presence of God. Verse number 15. In that he died for all, that is all that the Father given me, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. The love of Christ motivates us and moves within us so that we deny that human nature, the human nature says, life is all about me. Whatever it takes to gratify me, to make me happy, make me feel good, that's what my life is about. The love of God burning in the heart of a child of God says, it ain't so. What motivates me is the knowledge that my Lord loves me. He loved me so much that he gave his life for me. So it goes on to say that they which live should not live henceforth unto themselves, but unto him. The love of God compels us. It constrains us to live unto Christ. What does it mean to live unto? That means looking to Jesus Christ. That means hearing his words, obeying his words, depending upon him. When the storms of life are raging around me, what do we do? We lift up our eyes and we look uh, to that throne of grace where we obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We're looking unto Jesus. We're not living unto ourselves. We're living unto him. And you remember what Jesus Christ said about living unto him? In Matthew's writings, he says, there's coming a day. When the Father's going to say, come you blessed to my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He's going to say that. And then the children of God are going to say to him, well, uh, well he says, for when I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came into me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you gave me food to eat and all those kind of things. They're going to say, well, when did we see you in that condition? He says, as you've done it unto the least of one of these, my children, you've done it also unto me. Do you know that the Lord left us a new commandment in John chapter 13? He says, this is the new commandment that I'm giving to you. What was that new commandment? That you love one another. What does love one another mean? Just to have that warm, pitter-patter feeling in you? That's like faith. John says, you, you, you can say that you have faith. He said, you show me your faith by your word. Uh, um, uh, you, you tell me that you have faith, but I'm going to show you that I have faith by my works. So if you have love in your heart, what good is it if you don't show it? If you don't pick up the phone and call, or go check and see and, or, and, and petition. How can I help you? How can I encourage you? And look for encouraging words to, to move into it, to help folks. And when you see someone that's a little bit down in their countenance, encourage them. Help them, lift them up. Now then he says, Wherefore, 
Henceforth, wherefore, because that is true, from now on, henceforth, know no man after the flesh. <laughs> now listen to this carefully. Listen to it carefully. And remember the reason that he's writing to the church of Corinth. They were adding things that they ought not to be added to the worship. Henceforth, I said, wherefore, because this is true, henceforth, that is from now on, you know, if it was to tell, if he tells them henceforth, that is from now on, that means they must have been doing it. He says, no, no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know him no more. That is in the flesh. If Jesus Christ were on this earth, if he were to walk in this room this morning and you recognized him, what would you do? I believe my heart would tell me to get as low on the floor as I possibly could to reverence my God. I would want to say to him, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. You're my savior. You're my master. You love me with such a great love that you gave your life for me. He saved you from your sins. He rendered you just before God the Father. He put you into such a state of purity as if you had never, ever sinned. Paul said, don't you know anybody in that kind of way on this earth? Don't you reverence anybody that way on this earth? He said, we did Jesus Christ when he was here. That's the very reason why we primitive Baptists do not use the title reverend. Because we're taught in the scripture, in the, in the Psalms 111, I believe, uh, where we're taught that holy and reverend is thy name. Paul said, don't you know anybody that way? He says, he says, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we uh, him no more. He says, the only one on this earth that we've ever known that way, to reverence that way, is Jesus Christ. You know, He's our King. He's our Messiah. He's our Savior. He's our hope of eternal life. He is our all in all. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I rejoice to rejoice in the new things of my Lord. I have a new hope in my heart. I have a new zeal in my feelings. I have a new desire to serve my God. And how do I serve my God? By serving you. Now, goes on and says, all things are of God. That is, verse number 17, he says, uh, he's a new creature. That's, that's all these things that he's talking about. The new creature, he's made new. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us uh, to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry we serve, the doctrine of reconciliation. You have been reconciled to God when Jesus Christ paid. You had a great debt that you couldn't pay. And a, a debt so great, a sin debt so large, that you couldn't even make a dent in it. But one man, one time, by the offering of himself, paid that sin debt and resolved the debt problem, and now you have been reconciled to God the Father. Okay? Now he says, but we have the word of reconciliation. That means we, we minister it out. I like to talk about that, don't you? When I talk to someone about, somebody, I love for somebody to ask me, I give people the opportunity to ask me about primitive Baptist. If I can say, if I can find a way to put in the conversation and say that I attend a primitive Baptist church, I wait. I, I'm listening. I'm ready. I want them to say, well, what is a primitive Baptist? And then I, I like to tell them, it, it depends on how it comes to my mind at that time, but I like to tell them such things as Jesus Christ loved a people with such strength and such purity that he gave his life for them and he reconciled us to God the Father by one act of himself, period. Our home in heaven is secure by what Jesus Christ has done for us. Does that motivate you to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? I'm ready to serve. 
Then he goes on. Verse number 20, he says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech us by you, uh, you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. He says, now Paul says, now we are ambassadors. Do you know that your, your preacher, your pastor, in essence, is an ambassador from the Lord? If the gospel is preached, it's a message that God gives. He's bringing the word of God to you, that God, not to glorify, you know, an ambassador doesn't go to a foreign country for his own glory. He goes to another, uh, another country and represents his country and the leaders of his country to others. So a, an ambassador is one who represents God to you through the preached word. Okay. Then he says here, we pray you in Christ, uh, 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 Christ said, be ye reconciled to God. This is a, a, a practical reconciliation. That means if there's anything in our lives uh, that keeps us from being reconciled to God, get rid of it. That's a challenge, isn't it? Isn't that a challenge? Or am I the only one who has that problem this morning? I got to tell you this. I went by the other day to visit with Brother Barbara and Sister, uh, Brother Thomas and Sister Barbara, and Brother Thomas gave me a, a little skinny knife. I rode home thinking about that little skinning knife and how I want to go out there and hang on the side of that tree and sit real quiet and wait for that venison to walk by. I could just see that skinny knife preparing that new venison. I got to even think, I could even take a pork with that too, you know. That's sharp enough, I could, I could skin a pork with it too. And I, I enjoy those kind of things. But the challenge to me is to never, ever let those things get in the way of my service to God. So when I am sitting out there on the side of that deer stand, my cell phone is in my pocket. And some of you have called me while I was sitting on that deer stand. And I try not to let you think that you have interrupted me because you haven't. You know why? No, when I start talking to you, my voice goes for 400 yards in every direction and all those deer look up and say, he ain't talking to me. <laughs> but you are the most important thing in my life, period. Paul says, if there's anything that gets in the way of you worshiping and serving your God, get rid of it. Be you reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Here's that motivation again. The love of God. For he, that is God the Father, hath made him, Christ Jesus, to be sin for you. Now think about that for a moment. I could get stuck right here for the next four hours. Made him to be sin for us. I want you to tick this in your Bible. He knew no sin. That's like being accused of something that you did not do. Everybody thinks you did it. And shame comes upon you because you're seen as guilty of doing something that you didn't do. Jesus Christ knew no sin. He had never sinned. And there came a day, a day on the cross when that pure, righteous, holy and godly Savior, the Son of God, verily God, was made to be sin. It was necessary, as it was allegorized in the Old Testament by the scapegoat, that the sin was put upon it and it carried away so far that it could never return again. It was allegorized when the sins of Israel was confessed on the head of the other goat and the goat was offered for sin. Jesus Christ, that was a symbol pointing to Christ. Jesus Christ literally was made to be sin for you. He did not sin, but he took your sin in his person, in his mind. Every sin that we've ever committed, from Adam to the last one, he bore it in his body. In one moment, the pain, the shame of that sin. If you lay down on your bed tonight, 
and you start thinking about the sins that you committed in your life. I don't want to do that. I don't recommend it. But if you did, could you sleep? Thinking about those things, the shameful things in your life. In one moment, in one instant, at about three o'clock in the afternoon on that day, the Son of God, who knew no sin, was made to be sin for you. He took your sins away from you and bore it away so it's that God the Father, when He looked at you, He sees you as holy as Christ is holy. He sees you as just as Christ is just. He sees you as godly as Jesus Christ is godly because he shed his blood for you. Is that a great love? Wherewith he hath loved us? Does that motivate you? Why truly it motivates me. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Because of what he has done for you, you are right. No wrong. When God sees you, he sees you as perfectly righteous because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Chapter 6. Paul says here, We then, knowing that this is true, that the love of God has moved us, uh, but knowing that what Jesus Christ did has done for us, we then as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Vain means empty. Have you received the grace of God this morning? So just answer that within yourself. Have you received the grace of God in your life? In a practical sense, even in a spiritual sense. If you have, he says, don't receive it in vain. All right. So what does it mean to receive it in vain? <clears throat> Somebody, someone were to give us a a packet of prize tomato seeds. That's gracious, isn't it? Prize, you know, those great big red lush tomatoes. You know, you slice them off and slap them away, and the tomato slices. So when you make a tomato sandwich, it is so large it just laps off of the bread on all sides. You put a little salt and pepper and a little bit of mayonnaise on there, and you bite that tomato. And the juice just runs down, you know, and just, it's just so good. Somebody gave you some seed for those wonderful tomatoes like that. If you just kept them in the bag and you never planted them, nobody would get any benefit from them. You could brag about the fact, well, I have, I, I have these, these wonderful tomato seed. I mean, you go by and see somebody that says that, and you say, well, where's the tomatoes? Well, the seed's still in the bag. He says, if God has given you this grace, put it to use. Let it be seen. Let it be heard by what you say. Let it be seen by what you do. Let it be that which constrains you in this life, that you may glorify God in your life. Bring forth some fruit from it. Beseech you, we beseech you, also that ye receive not the grace of God in, gain, in vain. Now, let's skip on down for the sake of time. There's only about seven, eight minutes left. I want you to go with me to verse number four. Paul talks about the function of the ministry here. Ministry that functions out of the love of God. He says, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Now listen to this. I want you to tick through these things with me. In much patience. That word patience has endurance. One of the challenges of a pastor is that he has to endure with a smile on his face. So that nobody knows he's enduring anything. Uh, in much endurance. In affliction. You know, those things that set me back and harm me and discourage me. In necessities. Do without. Do without a lot. And we don't let anybody know that you're doing without. Just keep going. In distresses, you know, when things come at bothers and distresses, don't anybody know that you're being distressed. And then in his day, Paul says, in stripes, beating, all that, you know, 
40 time, uh, with 40 lashes save one several times. In distresses, in imprisonments, in tumults, in, in tumults. You know, that's disturbances. In disturbances among the Lord's people. In labors, in watchings, in fastings. And then how do we do that? Paul says, by pureness, by keeping our focus on the Lord, by remembering that we're constrained by the love of God, by knowledge, that is the knowledge of what my Lord has done for you. You know, it's good for us when we are enduring hard times in this life to stop and think, well, just how much did Jesus Christ love me? Long suffering, that means put up with things a long time. Just how long? Long enough. How long? Long enough. And then you ask, how long has the Lord been long suffering with me? If we want the Lord to be long suffering to me, then we're to be long suffering to each other in kindness. And then we do it by the Holy Ghost in us and by love unfeigned, that's unfaked. And, and then we do it by the word of truth. There is a truth, isn't there? You know, the modern philosophy says whatever you think is true is true and ain't so. You know, a lot of people think things that just ain't so. Just because a person believes a thing doesn't make it so. What is the truth is what Jesus Christ has said. And we give ourselves to that. Paul says, that's how we make it. We just hang our hat on what the real truth is. The word of truth, the power of God, and by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor, by dis some folks honor, some folks dishonor, some folks give us an evil report, some give us a good report, uh, some deceive us and some are true. Uh, we're recognized by some, we're an unknown to others. Uh, we're, 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 our bodies are dying, we're getting older, and yet we're alive, and uh, we're chastened, we, we face great trials, and, but yet we keep on, uh, we're not killed, we just keep right on going. And we're sorrowful sometimes, but we, in other times we rejoice, we're poor, but we have so much. Uh, we're, uh, we, and then, yet possessing all things. Then he says, O ye Christians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged, when a heart is enlarged, that means we love you. We endure all of these things for you. Then he, <laughs> he comes back to his message. He says, you're not straight. You don't have difficulty in us. The preached word doesn't make, doesn't upset you. But what upsets you is in your heart. Those things that distresses the love of God. When I disobey God, that's what distresses me. The preacher don't have to get up here and beat you over the head for doing wrong. You know that? You know why he doesn't have to do that? Because the spirit inside of us does that. All right? Now, chapter 7. Let's, let's bring this to a close. I want you to notice in chapter 7, verse number 1. Having therefore these promises. The promises that he's talking about is verse number 18 in the previous chapter. He says, and, and God the Father will be a father unto you. A father. Now, what is a father? A father is one who will love his children no matter what. Will provide, will lift up and encourage. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves uh, from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, you know, the love of God is such that we find some examples in the scripture. Let's go to the man Legion in Mark chapter 5. The man was possessed with all the devils. What do you suppose that he would say to you this morning if you were to ask him why he went home to his friends and told them how great things the Lord had done for him? What would he tell you? He would tell you, I was living in the tombs. I was alone, I was in pain, I was in distress. Uh, they tried to bind me, but I broke the fetters. They put chains on me, but I broke the chains. I cried all night long, I cut myself. I was so alone and no one could help me. But this man, Jesus Christ, came to my shores and he commanded those devils out of me. Now I am set in my right mind. I am clothed. And now I can go home and tell my friends how great thing the Lord has done. Do you think the legion had something good to say about the love of his God for him? 
What about Luke chapter 7, verse number 36, the sinner woman with the alabaster box who came to the Lord and anointed his feet with that precious ointment that the tears are flowing from her, from her eyes, bathing his feet with her tears and, and anointing them with the, with the oil, that precious oil that flowed down and, and then wiping uh, the feet of the master with her glory, her hair. The glory, uh, the glory of a woman is her hair. And she was wiping the master's feet with her hair. And the Lord rejoiced to see her day. He rejoiced that she was at his feet because she was showing love to him who loved her. She came to him because he loved her. And her sins were forgiven. You think she'd have something to tell? She'd like to tell her grandchildren. Oh, let me tell you about the time that I anointed the Savior's feet with oil and wiped them with my hair. Let me tell you about that. Can you see that sweet woman sitting there with her grandchildren on her lap telling them about the time? The tears are flowing from her eyes. I want to tell you about the day that I anointed my Savior's feet. What about the publican in Luke 18? The publican who stood afar. He was, he, he was so broken by his sin that he stood afar off. Couldn't even lift up his eyes into heaven, but smote himself upon the breast and said, Lord, have mercy upon me, a what? Sinner. The Lord says, this man is going away righteous. More than those who think they have made themselves righteous. What do you think that he would go home and tell his friend and family? Then in Mark chapter 15, what about the centurion that was standing on the hilltop? So all of these things happening, probably as a guard there, standing on that hill, saw them bringing the Lord up to the hill. He was already beaten in a bloodied mess. Saw the soldiers nailing him to the cross and heard him praying, Lord, lay this to their charge. Saw them raise that precious body upright and stand the cross up. And then heard him address his mother. And in essence, Jesus was saying, Mom, I'm going away, but John here is going to take care of you while I'm gone. Heard him saying that. And then the thieves early in the morning had been railing on him. After a while, one of them, one of them turned to him, say, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The centurion's hearing all of this. And then this blessed Savior turns to him and says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Do you think that that man went to his death knowing that his Savior loved him? And then that centurion, when it turned dark, so abominable was that scene that God the Father caused darkness to come upon the face of the earth. The earth quaked. And then that centurion heard the Lamb of God cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That centurion said, surely this was the Son of God. He was moved in his heart to know that that man that he was helping crucify that day was his Savior. He was his Messiah. He was his hope of heaven. He was his deliverance from sin. He experienced the love of God. My friends, I exhort you daily to meditate upon the love of God. May God bless you, my prayer.